Welcome, Virgo, to Catalyst Energies. My name is Dee. Thank you for joining me. I am so grateful that you are here. Virgo, welcome to your new moon forecast. This report is for the Virgo sun, moon, and rising folks. If you have these in your natal chart, uh, your progress chart, your draconic chart, wherever you find that strong Virgo in your astrology, this forecast is going to have something for you. So welcome back, everyone. Of course, if you're new here, welcome. Thank you for being here. And... Let's get right into it, my friends. Uh, Virgo new moon on the 14th of September, 2023. That is Thursday. It is exact at 9.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is at 21 degrees, 58 minutes of Virgo. So we are looking at the Virgo rising chart, even though this forecast is applicable to anyone with the sun, moon, or rising. But as per uh, the horoscope, we're going to look at the rising sign of Virgo as we go through this particular forecast. And this is just a also a reminder that if you're new to astrology and you're wondering how to keep up with it or learn about it for yourself or even just uh, read a horoscope for yourself. You always want to read for your rising sign or your ascendant. And that is the first house cusp here, as you can see on the left-hand side of the chart, if you are, in fact, looking at the screen here. And this is the eastern horizon at the time that you were born in terms of your location. So this is how we designate the rising sign or the ascendant. And from there, all of the other house cusps are calculated based on whatever house system you're using. So astrology turns out to be very technical and complicated as much as it may seem very not technical and uh, very holistic. And that's the beauty of astrology, in my opinion, is that it brings together the two sides, the left brain and the right brain, um, the artistic, holistic aspect of how you read a chart, but also the very technical, um, linear calculations that go along with this as well. So, uh, and wow, what a Virgo theme, right? Of blending the duality um, without letting go of the distinct parts of the polarity or duality. So let's get right into it. We're going to look at the new moon, which is exact on the 14th. As I've said, it's Thursday, September 14th. We're going to look at the main astrological themes for the next two weeks through the first half of the lunar cycle. So a new moon is a beginning in un consciousness. It is when the seed is viable and implanted into the soil. It is where we grow spontaneously and instinctually and organically um, in relation to the environment. And we lead up to our full moon, which is in culmination, uh, a revelation, an illumination. The moon acts as a mediator or an intercessor in some ways of the solar energy because in astrology the moon does represent um, the living soul and how we adapt to everything that's happening uh, within and around us and so the moon often is our emotional inner landscape how we feel how we adapt um, our intuition as well so Virgo is a mutable earth sign. It means that it is the functionality of that structure, which is related to the sign of Taurus, actually, and the second house. So in traditional astrology, Virgo would be the sixth house. Like I said, it's functionality. It is putting those resources to actual work. And so the Virgo person is no stranger to these types of actions and behaviors, right? Being disciplined, being dedicated to service, um, really striving for perfection in whatever the Virgo person is doing. Sometimes it moves into those types of compulsive uh, states of being, I guess you could say, where the Virgo person becomes very focused on organization and uh, details and being so meticulous that sometimes you get caught up in that process and letting go of a very important part of the Virgo archetype, which is intuition, right? Analysis is one thing, but without the intuition and the 
aspect of the earth sign itself, which is distinctly feminine or yin. Without that part of it, there is no real balance. And certainly without these two poles being recognized and working together, there is no inner transmutation or transformation. And that's ultimately what Virgo as a sign and people who are Virgo people, all of that work is to bring the individual to a state of perfection through works, through labors, through organization and being very meticulous and focusing on the details, right? If the second house is the structure, the sixth house is the functionality, putting it to work. So like I said, Virgo people, they are no stranger no stranger to what it means to be dedicated and to be self-sacrificing. Now, the challenge for a Virgo person, especially Virgo rising, um, which is the chart we're looking at right now, is that the seventh house, which is the area of life that represents the individual in relationship, any type of relationship, um, whether it be professional, personal, and it's often contractual or something that you are committed to. It is a one-on-one -on -one relationship that uh, creates its own form. And it's represented by Libra, right? The scales of balance, meaning that there is inevitably a state of balance or imbalance when we come into relationship. And it's our responsibility when we come into any type of relationship, whether it's between you and your boss, you and your spouse, you and your children, you and your parents, you and your clients. If you're in that type of professional relationship, you and society, you and source or God or the great spirit, whatever it is, it's the seventh house is who we are in that relationship. And for Virgo people, uh, when you are in relationship, it allows you to tap into the formless oneness, compassion, forgiving, uh, unconditionally loving individual that often is represented by Pisces, very artistic, very imaginative, very creative. But the thing is, is that the boundaries go out the window because it's Pisces, right? There is no boundary when you're talking about returning and surrendering back to all that there is. And so the, the real challenge for the Virgo person is to engage in relationship that allows that Pisces archetype to come forward without having to contend with um, the the downside of the empathic person, which is lack of boundary, a lack of emotional boundary, where you become a martyr, um, or you don't even know where you end and other begins. And I would say this new moon for the Vir for all of us, truly, but for the Virgo person, since you are representing the new moon in terms of its symbolic reference and the energy attached to it, the Virgo people, this is going to be a huge theme for you this month, which is where do you end and others begin in your projection of self as, um, a person who strives for perfection and service, okay? Because it's not truly service if you don't know who you are. And, the full moon that we're going to have on the 29th is actually in Aries. And for the Virgo rising chart, as you're looking at here, that is the eighth house. That is the house where we share resources. That is the house where we cooperate, where we come together whatever the relationship is, and we are more than the sum of our parts, right? Communion uh, leads to a faith in uh, the potential of relationships. So the eighth house has, you know, a dark energy attached to it because you're talking about shadow work. You're talking about power dynamics. You're talking about the occult. You're talking about your own subconscious. But ultimately, it is how we do business and how we come together to create and generate something more than what is already provided for us. And that comes through cooperation. And as you can see, Virgo, your spark of divinity, the Aries archetype, right? You as a subjective seed that belongs to the great spirit that is divine in and of itself is in the process of sharing and sharing yourself with other in order to generate something more than what both came into the process with. And as you can see, Chiron is here and the north node of the moon is here. And Mercury, yes, is 
the ruler of Virgo in terms of the way that our mind and our cognitive abilities allow us to analyze, right? So there's a big part of analysis that comes into the Virgo archetype. If Gemini in the third house, for instance, uh, ruled also by Mercury is about um, observation, empirical data, right? Just learning. The sixth house is the actual analysis. So, you know, part of the scientific method that that would be the analysis part of all of your data, right? But you also have to bring in the intuition. And if the third house is and Gemini is ruled by Mercury, the magician, right? The sixth house is ruled by the hermit, right? Going into one's own darkness in order to eventually bring the light out and light the way for others. That's the true role of the hermit. I mean, it gets it gets kind of out of out of whack and it certainly goes sideways when that hermit energy is more of a bypass or is running away or just getting away from society or not engaging in relationship. That's kind of a negative aspect of it. But for the for the positive Virgo uh, energy, it is about knowing when to go under the surface and do the real work. So Virgo is not glamorous like Leo is. Uh, Virgo is getting it done. The sixth house, which is the Virgo house, is about getting your shit together. So when the moon does come into Aquarius, um, before, um, coming into the seventh house and before coming into, uh, the full moon in Aries, this is where, uh, the Virgo person is going to be very sensitive to those types of behaviors, those actions, the work, right? You got to put in the work and the time if you want to really perfect yourself as a vessel. So, Knowing where you end and others begin and reinforcing that coat of arms is the theme of this new moon for all of us. And for the Virgo person, it is really, really essential because if you drop the ball and no pressure, Virgo, <laughs> if you drop the ball on this, um, then, you know, when the moon comes into Pisces before the full moon, it will be very clear here. Um, your sensitivity to who you are in relationship, whether that you are just giving yourself over in terms of martyrdom and there is no boundary um, and you just kind of find yourself dissolving away or you come to realize as it's coming into the fullness of the actual full moon that um, you are able to tap into that compassion, that true empathy, a sense of um, real charitable focus on on whoever you're in relationship with. And like I said, it depends on who, who and what it is, but, um, you, the, the, the full armor of God, the Ephesians chapter six, I would really recommend that you familiar, even if you're not a Christian, even if you don't find yourself really into the Bible at all, just for the sake of the imagery I would really encourage you to read Ephesians 6 chapter, I would say chapters 10 through, I mean, verses 10 through 18. Those are the ones that I read. And that's kind of a daily for me personally. Um, and that's in the New Testament because it talks about not only the armor of God, but all of the other instruments that the individual uses to stand in the face of evil and darkness. And if you have no sense of real boundary or compassion or even that royal coat of arms, which is the degree of this f new moon, as we're going to go into, then when um, when that presents itself as maybe a uh, delusion or a false uh, transcendence, you're not going to know the difference. And you find yourself just kind of getting pulled into that relationship, into that dynamic without any sense of boundary. So Virgo is about the blending of the polarity um, in order to then surrender to the divine role in relationship, whatever that is. Okay. So I hope, I hope that makes sense. The other thing that is really important to point out just in general is that Mercury is your chart ruler. Um, 
especially if you're a Virgo rising, if you're a, a Virgo sun, then Mercury is your planetary ruler. But I would say, and actually it's not me that says it, I take this directly from this particular, not this book, this book, um, this is Chiron, trans, um, The Bridge Between the Inner and Outer Planets by Barbara Hanclough. This is a really good uh, reference book if you are studying astrology, if you want to be practicing astrology, if you want to deepen your understanding of Chiron, this is a great resource. And Barbara Hanclough also, you know, this is where I got it from. She had uh, designated Chiron as also the ruling body of Virgo. And I, I agree with that. And I actually um, put that into my readings that is factored into all of my personal readings with individuals. So um, I would recommend this if you are again, studying astrology, deepening your understanding of astrology. It's very much a reference for people who are astrologers. So just keep that in mind, but it's great information about Chiron and uh, being that the eighth house is something that this full moon is moving towards as we are going to talk about and this is where Chiron currently in its retrograde is in this area it's important that um, you're very aware that you find your spark in the space of, of sharing so the th I know and, and so Mercury is going to station direct right after the new moon on the 15th, right? In your first house. And so things that have been, um, that you have been maybe processing, there's been a lot of internalized processing. Um, you've been really thinking about yourself, who you are, um, how you project yourself into the world, Virgo, because these are all first house types of things. Um, it's about to turn back on and start moving forward here. And Mercury, as your chart ruler in your first house or in your sign it's going you know the analysis aspect you know putting things to work to really crunching the numbers to really organizing yourself is going to start turning back on it's it's kind of cheesy I know but the thing that really like came out as I was preparing this forecast <laughs> was um, a song. It was the, the chorus to a song, or at least a couple lines to a chorus of a song, which is a Bruce Springsteen song. So maybe it's because it's kind of fresh on my mind. I got to see um, Bruce Springsteen in the E Street Band probably for the, the last time, for me, the only time, um, but for the last time as well, probably for me um, in Madison Square Garden last spring. And it was amazing. Like I haven't been to a show like that in a really long time. Um, but the song that came out in reference to your forecast for this new moon was Dancing in the Dark. And, you know, listen to the song. You can listen to all the lyrics. But the things that really spoke to me in reference to all of this, especially with Chiron being your other uh, ruling body in the eighth house. This is also where the moon's north node, right? The head of the dragon, the trajectory of the soul on its journey through various, you know, the multiple incarnations, regardless if you feel like reincarnation is natural or being trapped in the matrix, God allows all of it. And so even if you have been here multiple times as a result of being trapped, and that's what you believe, the reality is that we still have a soul that is infinite and eternal that is growing and developing and evolving. And the North Node is that trajectory. So it's also in your eighth house, showing that the soul is also pulling you right now in the areas of what it is that you share. And the, the, the lyrics in the chorus of that song that really stuck out to me is you can't start a fire without a spark. And the spark uh, archetypally and symbolically is Aries. It's the divine spark. It's the electrical spark. You can't start a fire without a spark. And then the rest of it is this guns for hire, even if we're just dancing in the dark. And dancing in the dark is a big eighth house energy. And so the thing is about Chiron, if you're already familiar with Chiron, if you're like, what the hell is Chiron? I would encourage you to do some research as a Virgo person um, if you're trying to understand yourself because Chiron in Greek mythology was a, uh, a centaur but was not a normal centaur, right? He was more fully 
uh, humanoid than animal, whereas the traditional centaur was a um, humanoid at the top and all horse at the bottom. Well, Chiron uh, came out as all humanoid from top to bottom and then had the ass end of a horse, right? So he was an outcast on both sides, but he was also immortal. He was also an incredible healer. Um, he was also an incredible teacher, and he is known for um, being a teacher for all of these other really incredible healers and um, was adopted by Apollo and taught all of the arts that Apollo is uh, known for. And But at the end of the day, his own hybridization, because he truly was a hybrid, uh, was not able to release him from his own suffering. And so the story is that Chiron was shot in the ankle or the foot by a poison dart and he wasn't able to heal himself, but he also wasn't able to die. So he just lived in pain. And the idea here, the, the, the mundane generic wounded healer of Chiron is that at the end of the day, at the end of our experience, that we have to give up the very thing that has made us, uh, and we all have Chiron in our chart, we all have this struggle in different ways. We all have to face the thing, the wound that we keep open in our lives in order to heal, in order to teach, in order to assist and be of service to others. But at the end of it all, we... We're, we are always tasked with giving it up in order to truly heal from our own suffering, to release ourselves from our own suffering. And Virgo, um, this new moon is really about if you are going to step into this role, um, uh, this royal role um, of Raja Yoga, right, the, the highest rung in terms of the yogic paths, then this is going to be a big part of this is acknowledging where you have continued to keep that wound open because it's the only identity that you really can identify that you really know about yourself and you you will be tasked we all are but in particular that is this what you want to be sharing right or is it possible that the real um the real juice the real meat of it you know um the fire that needs to be started with a spark comes from not keeping that wound open, but truly um, releasing yourself from your own suffering. So what did Chiron do? Chiron basically had a deal brokered where he took the place of Prometheus, who was chained to a rock forever for having the audacity to give fire to humanity. So he says, you know what, I'm going to take Prometheus's place and set Prometheus free and I will take on mortality and die. Right. So he wasn't tor Chiron didn't take his place and was tortured infinitely. He took his he took the place of Prometheus and attained mortality. And once was able to do that is able to release himself from his own suffering. Right. The pain that he couldn't heal from himself. And so Chiron being an actual comet asteroid between Saturn and Uranus and Uranus is often made you know has this connection to prometheus and i know this is kind of a roundabout way but i swear this has a lot to do with that ninth house of yours virgo of uranus and jupiter which are now both retrograde in that nine house ninth house of your belief systems um you can't start a fire without a spark and if the ninth house is anything it is that it is that frictional fire that transmutes and if you don't have that spark then how are you going to light the fire that truly alchemizes your experience into um, a broad sense of understanding of wisdom, true wisdom? Now, Jupiter loves to be in the ninth house and is now recently stationed retrograde. So I think this is about and Uranus, too. So there is some, some serious um, internalization and going back over uh, in terms of belief systems, what you believe about yourself, what you believe about relationship and the value of relationship. What do you understand? What is the big picture for you? And this is an important time to really steal yourself, Virgo, um, with this new moon and setting the intentions, okay? Uh, Mercury stationing direct, I think, is really going to help with this process, um, truly, but it's that eighth house. And um, all of the things that are going to come up um, throughout the next two weeks, connecting to Chiron, connecting to the nodes of the moon, and certainly Uranus and Jupiter up in that ninth house. Um, you know, it is, it is the alchemical process where you create something brand new. And, um, you know, the third house, it's opposition 
connection is all of the pieces of the puzzle. It's all the threads of the tapestry coming together, but it's the way that it's woven together it from the eighth into the ninth house that creates the full mosaic, the full pattern, the full abstraction, right? That the right side of the brain is able to be like, oh, that's the big picture. So yes, there are some things that are now kind of uh, folding in on itself with, uh, and things that are, um, coming into your experience internally with these retrogrades that are important to um, be aware of and to honor. And it's I, I, that eighth house, it, you know, Virgo has to really uh, just know that you can't start that fire without a spark. And I think that this is a big part of where this full moon is going. So I also want to share with you right now, um, a, you know, the degree of uh, Virgo at 22 degrees. So this is based off the Sabian symbols. Um, again, my reference to all of this is a book called An Astrological Mandala, The Cycle of Transformations, and it's 360 symbolic phases, right? And this is by Dane Rudger. This is a huge resource for me. This is probably like my primary resource. You can find this book is out of print. So it's very expensive if you're trying to buy it but you can find it used in some places. It is available on Internet Archive as a download for basically free. So if you're interested in this, it has every degree of the Zodiac and the Sabian symbol associated with it and a nice write-up by Dane Rudger about it. So I wanted to share that with you in case you're interested, but ultimately I want to read to you what is the what is the Sabian symbol of 22 degrees Virgo? And in Sabian symbol work, you always round up to the next degree. So a royal coat of arms enriched with precious stones, okay? Now, again, this Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, think about it as the full armor of God. Think about it as the breastplate of the high priest. And why are these stones precious, right? Uh Beside, and this has a lot as well to do with Uranus and the degree that Uranus is in because 23 degrees of Taurus as well is about, um, you know, a jewelry shop. It's about these precious stones being valuable in and of themselves. And it is society or, or us really that gives it its value and worth in terms of the way we adorn it and the way that we identify it. Right. But these Stones are precious in and of themselves because they are created by nature. They are created by the elements, right? They are here inherently valuable. It's what we do with them that makes the difference, right? It's not that they are only valuable because we use them. It is the value is brought forward when we use them correctly. So these precious stones, as many of you who have been part of my the last Reiki, uh, three-week Reiki attunement event, we created a grid and a crystal grid and I went into all of the different crystals and I really would like to do that again. I'm not sure if it's going to happen for the equinox. I'm hoping for the solstice we can do that event. I'm actually going to be doing an in-person type of event for the equinox um, that's Reiki oriented. So, but this royal coat of arms is about stepping into a role that has more, less to do with the individual and more about a status um, that has its roots in a tradition or in a past. And it says here that every great adept, right, has come out of a line of human beings who have made their mark. It is more than just the individual. You're taking on the coat of arms, right, as something that has been passed down and is being given to you. It is something that is, um, you are, it's spiritual attainment. And this is for the Virgo person to your pr projection of self, who you are, how you present yourself to the world. And so this is the beginning. So allowing the self to start, um, you know, those enzymatic processes within the seed are starting to um, get triggered and start to activate. And the seed is uh, starting to prepare to germinate, right? This is kind of how I look at it. And this is the beginning here for you, Virgo. So putting on that royal coat of arms, that certification of that status, that royal status is about stepping into a role that you have been endowed with and you have attained through your practice, your discipline, your sense of dedication and service. But it's just the beginning, right? Um, and Mercury stationing direct right after this is also um, a big part of 
a big part of this as well, which is on the 15th. You're going to see that Mercury stations direct on the 15th, and you also are going to see that the sun is going to be in a trine to Uranus, right? So this, um, this Earth trine, as we talk about Uranus in the ninth house, right, which always is setting someone up for like a total religious conversion, right? And not to make it too direct in that like religious conversion. But the, the idea here is a full psychological overhaul because your belief systems go through a rapid change as, as a result of, well, your belief systems over undergo a, a change because of rapid shifting in the landscape of what you believe, what is um, the purpose of your relationships, okay? And of course, the retrograde of Uranus is also showing that this is a lot of internalized process in terms of what you believe. And so when Uranus comes back to this point later, um, well, in 2024, it will have a different um, feeling to it. It will have a sense of um, real change. Right now, this is a lot of internalized experiences. So uh, Mercury stations direct and the sun trines Uranus. Now, when you have a sun trine Uranus, just in general, it is, you, you become more open-minded, you become more adventurous and experimental. Um, this has a lot to do with, you know, the sun in your first house is very much you yourself are shining. That Virgo aspect of who you are is projecting out into the world very brightly. And then in a trine, 120 degree angle to, um, to Uranus in this ninth house is your intuition gets heightened. There's flashes of insight, glimpses of the future, right? And, and can lead to a greater self-awareness and confidence to express your personality, right? Especially the unique side or the quirky side. Um, and this is a time of unexpected, but positive change. So the thing about the degree that the sun is in, in this trine, especially right after the new moon, is about taming the vital energies, right? Um, you don't, you want to practice some amount of resoluteness and patience. And as a Virgo person, this is not exactly hard for you, right? The, the challenge is that to not, not take advantage of something that is new and outside of your routine, to be aware of the unexpected change in terms of your belief system. Your, um, you know, the ninth house also is about higher education, it is about um, advanced training, right? And so that might be part of like a really rapid shift in um, the value, the inherent value of what that means to you. And perhaps some sort of opportunity just kind of like presents itself. And oftentimes you may not find yourself jumping on things until all of your ducks are in a row with Virgo, but you know, change can occur quickly, but, but this is a transit that allows you to at least internally adapt, um, you know, to new conditions and making changes and having the confidence to leave your comfort zone because you are displaying your skill and character to tame those vital energies. Now, Venus is also direct now, I would like to point out in your 12th house in Leo, by the way. So, um, she rules Taurus. And in the 12th house, I mean, the value, the sense of beauty and harmony, and in the case of Virgo, right, really being the center of um, her own universe here, or certainly the center of her own system, uh, is very much directed at the uh, transcendental and the social consciousness, but the social spiritual consciousness, something that has to do with transcendence. Oftentimes it's in isolation that we kind of surrender back to where we came from in the 12th house. And so sometimes it's considered bondage. Sometimes you have to go through a, a point of isolation through sickness, hospitalization, you go to prison, right? So that's the other thing too. And Venus and Leo, especially now that she's moving direct, she really is dramatizing this situation for herself um, and as, as a release, as a... Uh, release of that vital energy. So, and we'll get to, we'll get to Venus because she's going to be squaring Jupiter. She's going to be squaring Uranus by the end of, by the time we get to the full moon. And so being aware of her presence in your 12th house, now that she's moving direct is really important. So, but this sun trine Uranus with the new moon is like, you know, these changes can occur, but you can 
um, have some confidence to leave your comfort zone, take a few risks, even if it's a small thing within yourself with that Uranus retrograde. It may not be this dramatic thing right now, but it may just be more of a, huh, uh, maybe this, this change is going to change, you know, lead you in a new direction around advanced training, higher education, um, wisdom, right? Um, travel, gosh, the ninth house is long, you know, long distance travel, broadening horizons. So the change comes, but you have the capacity to really, uh, um, look at it as something positive and be more adventurous. I mean, adventure does come when you kind of broaden those cultural horizons and go further and be and progress. Absolutely. And Mercury stationing direct is really going to give you as a Virgo person kind of like that. Okay, let's actually start planning. Actually, there there is another transit during this time. There's another Mercury in a trine to Jupiter. Again, that's another one of these moments of really good long range planning opportunity. So the 17th. Um, so now we're looking at the weekend and we're going to go into the 17th because speaking of Venus and Jupiter, this is where that square happens. Now, Let's make sure that this is formatted correctly. Yes, sir. Um, this is a transit where Venus in a square, like all squares, right? They create a tension. And sometimes we act out because of that tension. And sometimes we lean into it and we really grow. So Jupiter in, in its retrograde in the ninth house, again, you know, the big picture expansion is now kind of internally expanding. Maybe it feels like it's deflating a little bit. Ooh, I'm getting a big one on that. Um, and I also know for a fact in certain, uh, my personal life watching this with other people, um, the deflation may feel, um, very real, uh, in terms of the big picture and that adventure and that broadening that you've been really enjoying, to be honest, for a while now. So the square from Venus to Jupiter often will be very ideal for having fun, but it's not very good for working hard. So you feel happy, you feel optimistic, you feel friendly. And these are in areas that have to do with your, um, these are areas that have to do with your social identity and expression, the top of the chart, right? So if you have to attend to things that are more serious, then um, it can be a challenge here. And there's a tendency towards excess and extravagance when you're in a really festive mood with this type of square. And I, I would say here that this, um, that it's okay to have some fun, right? And with Jupiter in its retrograde, maybe you don't have to work so hard. Maybe take a, take a break, right? Now, this doesn't mean that you should go balls to the wall here. Sorry if that offends you, but honestly, it doesn't mean you should go balls to the wall and just like totally start going on a bender because you're like, you know what? I earned this. I'm going to take a break because Venus in the 12th house, again, you know, the, the release of her dynamic, uh, expressive energy, right? The, her heart, um, that is beaming out in the 12th house, you know, um, is affecting more than just the individual. Although Venus is all about her own comfort and especially in Leo, but just be aware of how much your activities and your behavior, um, affects other people in the long run. And so again, if you're feeling deflated in terms of the big picture or you, the expansion you've been enjoying, it's okay to have fun, right? It's okay to feel generous and friendly and enjoy yourself, right? Be festive. Um, just, you know, moderation is very important because, um, you don't want to, you don't want to overdo it and find yourself, um, getting into problems. And of course, if you have to deal with something very serious, this can be a very difficult transit, but it's the weekend, um, Sunday, the 17th. So I would say do what you can to just enjoy it and maybe give yourself a break for like just a moment. Okay. Um, now when we get to the 18th and the 19th, um, which is early, uh, next week, before we get to our first quarter moon, there is some pretty interesting stuff going on. So the moon comes into Scorpio, right? Which is normally the eighth house, um, energy. 
And what you're going to find here, actually, on the 19th in particular, is we're going to see a grand cross because the moon is going to be opposite of Uranus, and that has its own kind of upheaval going on. But also the sun is going to be opposite Neptune. So this is something that is really worth paying attention to, okay? Um, now, the moon is in the third house for you, Virgo, in Scorpio, and so the sensitivity to the patterns, the underlying patterns, the uh, the depth of what's going on right around you, the truth of what's going on right around you and how it feels. It's, you know, moon and Scorpio, we get very deep into these feels, okay? So one of the good things before this even happens is that the moon is in a trine to Saturn. It's in a sextile to Mercury. And so there's patience, there's emotional strength. Um, you yourself... Um, you can really kind of be a good, you can put people at ease with the intuitive understanding of what they're saying, right? And what's going on, the underlying subtext of what they're talking about, because you can feel it with the moon in, in the third house in Scorpio. So that's really beneficial. This is on the 18th, but when we come into the 19th here, um, there's a lot of challenge and the, not the least of which is the sun opposite Neptune. So this is a transit that makes you very susceptible to confusion and deception. And this is about who you are and who you are in relationship, okay? And if you can avoid the ego conflicts in this situation and find a safe place, this is a great time to develop a creative or spiritual nature. And in the case of... Um, you know, being a Virgo person and having this Pisces seventh house, being very charitable, right? Actually very compassionate and being able to um, fully be of service without losing yourself in the confusion and deception. So if you can't avoid some sort of harsh reality in this situation, which I, again, with the moon in Scorpio, especially opposite Uranus, this can be very harsh. Um, you need to take precautions to prevent loss and disappointment. So, um, especially with Neptune in, in Pisces in your seventh house like this, I mean, it just dissolves all the boundaries that would exist between you and others. So it's making the, the defenses are weakened in a sun opposite Neptune transit. So if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. So learn to say no and walk away. You may not want to agree to anything or sign anything in terms of relationship. Oh my gosh, like whatever commitments you may be making in terms of relationship um, and commitments and contracts, I'd be very, very wary of starting anything new, at least delay them um, until this transit passes, right? Um, and be very clear with yourself in terms of your relationships, Virgo, whatever they are, and your intentions. You cannot have any gray areas. You have got to, this is like setting boundaries like no other, um, because there's lots of deception. There's underhanded tactics that are going to be used with this transit at the macro and certainly in your own personal life. Um, and it'll be very tempting to escape the harsh realities through, again, um, drugs and alcohol, any form of unhealthy escapism. So be um, and it, uh, overdose, my gosh, this is a huge transit for overdose, especially that Neptune is in Pisces. It is its home sign. And the sun in Virgo, let's face it, is in its fall position, not the season fall. It is in its fall position, means it's weaker than it usually is. And so um, unfortunately for the sun in Virgo people, that's just going to be the case. And so just be aware of this transit. Now, the Grand Cross is obviously something that has to be these two um, opposite, these two oppositions that are creating tensions in different directions. So a moon opposite Uranus, again, will create a strong need for independence, which contradicts your need for emotional support, which is the moon in, in your third house, right in front of you, your immediate environment, your siblings, your household, you know, your coworkers, the people that you interface with on a daily basis is in your third house, right? What you know. And so there's going to be also this strong um, need for independence, which is Uranus over here in the big picture and your emotional support with what you know and what's right in front of you. So this can lead to uncertainty and stress and mood swings, emotional detachment. You may become easily distracted or anxious. So don't overreact or rebel. So you see how it's like, don't, 
commit to anything, but at the same time, the <laughs> the grand cross here of just like, but also you might find this uh, really strong urge to just like rebel against anything. So this is a time for waiting and preparing for a new cycle. So flexibility and adaptability are needed because unexpected events and sudden changes become possible. So your instincts and intuition may be unreliable. Boy, when you get to this date, which is the 19th, which is next Tuesday, um, just be very aware of all of the disruption and chaos and impulsive reactions that could come out and how easily weakened we can be in relationships. So don't necessarily, you know, you may find yourself faced with a situation where you can, um, oh boy, I'm getting big hits about like somebody coming back into your life or attempting to bring you back into some sort of situation and you want to, um, you want to, you, you want to take that energy and transmute it or transubstantiate it in some way because you want to be in this, you want the emotional support. Just be patient with yourself. Uh, be patient with the situation. Sit back and just let, I know it's uncomfortable, but this is exactly where we need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and go back to that new moon right? Because we're still in the new moon phase at this point, are we not? Like we have, oh, now we're in the crescent moon. So they're going to start feeling the obstacles that are going to present itself, um, that are going to become much more uh, on the surface when we get to the first quarter moon. Now, <laughs> now we're going to talk about Pluto, speaking of Scorpio and the eighth house and stuff like that. So we're kind of like tabling the eighth house energy for just a minute. It's going to come back. So when we get to the 21st, so we go through the week, the moon moves through Scorpio, it's going to move into uh, Sagittarius, and we're going to see all kinds of connections with Venus and Chiron, just like I said, Venus, Chiron, the moon and Sag. Now the moon and Sag is going to be in your fourth house, Virgo. So you're going to be really sensitive to those uh, family dynamics, your sense of personal power, your private life, where your power comes from, your root system, right? Um, which is the house that Jupiter is ruling and now it's retrograde. So that's the other thing going on. The sensitivity here is deep and, um, very, you know, your intuition is incredibly, it's almost prophetic when you're talking about Sagittarius, but remember Jupiter is retrograde now. So it's very internalized, um, now, the first thing I want to talk about, though, on the 21st is that the moon, I'm sorry, the sun in your sign, trying to Pluto, okay? Pluto is in your fifth house. It's been in your fifth house for a very long time, since 2008, really. Um, it is going to come out of your fifth house finally and forever, um, coming into 2024 okay which is pluto coming into anybody's sixth house is like ooh, oh boy there is a lot of elimination um and exposure and destruction that lead oh, that leads to really getting your shit together virgo but we'll talk about that later at some other time. Right now, the sun in a trine to Pluto in your fifth house, right? Your creative expression, your authentic voice, whether it be laughter and um, joy or sorrow and tears, whatever it is, it's your heart fully expressing itself. Um, and really, you're expressing the, the, the divine energy moving through you um, creatively somehow, right? You're putting it out there. You are... Um, draw it's it's dramatic it is uh it is taking a social risk right or a personal risk it is joy and excitement and thrill and lust and romance right and you got pluto in your fifth house i mean like talk about the sexual energy of your own lust and desire um being really strong and potent and has been for a long time um and the power of just your own voice, right? So now, of course, Pluto is retrograde, sitting on the natal Pluto of the U.S. chart in Capricorn. So the, the, the exposure of elimination of what's been eliminated so far is part of what is being voiced, I think, um, and where the Virgo person is voicing themselves through. So when the sun in Virgo is in a trine to Pluto, it brings very profound experiences. So whatever you're interested in now, you'll be driven to research. And I feel like that this is a big part of what we just talked about with the moon Uranus opposition while the moon is in Scorpio, right? Pluto rules Scorpio. This 
is that Sun Neptune opposition, what it brings out in in you in terms of who you are and who you are in relationship and then whatever kind of comes out of it this particular transit is going to really bring an intense and profound experience in terms of you and the way you express yourself so whatever you're interested in now you're going to be really driven to research and investigate right? Especially about what's been exposed at the institutional level, um, and how you, you know, how you are seizing your own power, right? So you have a greater power and influence over your own life. And that allows for positive transformation about your creativity, about your creative, authentic expression, right? You can exert this influence over the events in your life and those around you. So this is a great, opportunity to clear away any clutter right to you know make your voice and your authentic expression very um very clean right to get all the grime and the clutter away because you yourself are seizing power over your own identity right and oh boy yeah, the, that sun opposite Neptune, it's ooh, it's going to be a really game changer for Virgo people. Um, personal or professional problems can also be more easily resolved. Now, remember, the sun and Pluto are in the bottom of the Virgo rising chart. This is um, identity and then the expression of identity. So you can resolve your own issues around um, you, you and how you express yourself or the nature of your self-expression. And you can take on more of a um, leadership role in because of this. And I think it has a, so much more to do with who you are and being true to yourself. Um, and then you have this ability to make positive change and have a really profound experience in terms of your voice and, and also your voice and your heart leading to your projection of self being a very strong, um, personal, like just power of your own will. I think this is a very, um, powerful transit on the 21st. And then, um, it's the first quarter moon in, in Sagittarius comes right after. Now, as with all first quarter moons, it is a crisis in action. What do I do? Because you've already, we've all already, started with this new moon and it's a beginning in unconsciousness. It's an, it's like I said, spontaneous and organic and instinctual. And we are reacting to what is presented to us versus responding to things that starts coming after the first quarter. So just like all squares, we don't resolve the square. We lean into how it's uncomfortable and it's at the very last degree of Sagittarius and Virgo. So you have this mutable energy involved here at the very last degrees of these signs um, of your sign, Virgo, and then of Sagittarius, which is, again, the, the ruling area or the, the house of rulership of Jupiter in its retrograde. So the last degree of Sagittarius is a funny Sabian symbol. It's not funny. It's just the Pope, right? The Pope blessing people. It's the idea that at the end of Sagittarius, right, all the meaning of relationship eventually crystallizes into actual institutional roles and structures. So this degree is about the, you know, that meaning and that transmutation f finalizing and being ready to solidify into a structure or institution. And so as the Virgo person is in their identity and the expression of self, I am fully engaged. I am fully focused, like totality of what I am focusing on, like completely um, conquering all illusion about self at this point. The square is, yeah, but... What it, what do I do as I am very deeply sensitive to my family, to um, those root systems that stabilize me emotionally and becoming a symbol of that, those, those structures, those root systems, those traditions, my family, right? Because that in itself is going to provide, I think, the, the, the tension and restriction about what the Virgo role really is. It's not about the individual. The individual perfects themselves in order to be of service. And this particular square, I think, is going to just really bring out like, okay, so what do I do, right? Do I step into this role as a 
representative or do I continue to identify and express myself of this completely, you know, so focused, right? Eye on the prize here. Um, and that's a question you're going to have to figure you know, you're going to have to come to this moment and feel into the discomfort. And then, you know, we go on from there towards the full moon. So the big transits. Now we do have the equinox right after that. So the sun comes into your second house, which is all about your, um, resources and identifying yourself with your resources and, you know, Libra being the scales of balance, justice, fairness, um, equanimity, adjustment, right? That is the Libra card in the tarot, for instance. So we, we come into the equinox, we see that Venus and, um, Chiron are in a trine to each other. And again, I feel like that this has a lot to do with, um, this trine right here, I, again, feels like you, you have to find that place within your own spirit where you value and find a sense of personal harmony, um, at a, at a societal level, right. At it, with the collective unconscious, um, with that, which it allows you to kind of just relax and to have real companionship and the trine to Chiron and retrograde is, is, it, I feel like that in itself is allowing for you to kind of transcend all of the strife and be unattached to um, the feels that can be very hard in the eighth house, right? Because we are more than the sum of our parts. And so in the eighth house, that's the goal. And so Chiron is struggling with how do I transcend the conflict, but also be very much present with what is being created. And I feel like it's Venus in the 12th, right? Finding that sweet place within, um, the social unconscious, the collective unconscious where you yourself, maybe you are the houseboat, right? Out on the water and having a good time. Um, maybe it is in, um, the belief systems, the, uh, all of those Taurus energies. The other thing too, is that Venus rules Libra. And so coming into the equinox and then having this trine also Venus in terms of the second house for the Virgo people is something to pay attention to as well, because, um, if Venus is ruling your second house, which, you know, she really, you, you know, traditionally does ruling Taurus, then, um, there's a sense of aesthetic beauty and harmony and balance at a social level as well. And so again, Virgo, you got to find that balance, right? And it's going into the soul right? Going into the transcendent experience, going into your own, um, experience of surrendering back to what is, what is God essentially, or source in order to feel that sense of relaxation, companionship and, and balance, right? And that will allow the end of you in terms of what you're sharing, how you're cooperating to transcend that situation and not to get attached to all of the negativity involved, but still be present um, in, in the situation. I think the equinox is going to be very good in that way. Now the moon is in, uh, Capricorn at this point, And let's see here. Um, it's just going to, it's going to go through Capricorn. Mars is going to come into, as you can see here, Mars is going to come into an opposition with, uh, Chiron speaking of Chiron. So you can see that the energy around this eighth house is starting to build again towards, um, in the first quarter phase leading up to the full moon. And honestly, this is just going to bring the warrior out in you. Um, Mars in anybody's second house is a consistent, um, uh, output of energy and resources. And so, uh, again, this opposition is just a tension and Mars is outputting what is inherently yours, what is inherently available to you. What are your resources? It's outputting it, um, in a way that is, that is, kind of taking that warrior position. I'm going to balance these scales. Right. And again, the opposition is like, well, you can't get so emotional. I'm not emotionally attached. You can't get so personally attached. I would say, um, to the out, you know, you can't control every aspect of what is created when you step into relationship. But if you don't have any boundaries about it, then you don't have any input. Really. You're again, this is the Pisces seventh house energy. So 
uh, this opposition with Mars and Chiron, I just think is really important in terms of just feeling that warrior energy kind of come out and what that brings out in the Virgo person. So the, the sun is going to quincunx Saturn, um, as well, um, on the same day, right? It's an inconjunct. And this is a very difficult, um, type of transit because it basically creates an imbalance between what you want to do and what you have to do. What is your responsibility? And Saturn in the seventh house is responsibility to your relationships. Um, and so there's going to be this mix of freedom versus restriction that is going to change with this. Okay. And so again, something in your life is going to change, right? You may have to take time off work because there's an illness. You may have to look after a sick family member. Your career may suffer. This seems to have a lot to do, I would say, with, um, you, you know, sun coming into your second house of resource, um, and then Saturn in relationship there, there's going to be some sort of change here that is going to, um, change the nature of what you are doing, um, because of responsibility to relationship, whatever that relationship is. So there's, there's so much possibility for disappointment because of lack of results. There's could be criticism from your boss or some sort of authority figure, hard work, patience, and self-discipline are so essential in a sun quincunx Saturn like this. Um, an imbalance may arise be between your goals and the expectations of others. So you can see Virgo that these challenges are mounting around these types of themes in your life because, and they are going to require you to adjust yourself in terms of all of this and go back and may, you know, go back to the new moon right? You step into this role and what it means. And then everything else that comes about, you're going to have to face and go back. Am I reinforced? Can I step into this role? What does it mean to step into this role, right? A Virgo being of service. Um, in extreme cases, you might get really overwhelmed or it may be too much, right? And you feel constantly torn between um, responsibilities that can lead to competing responsibilities. Um, don't waste time by procrastinating. Just take one thing at a time, right? And find finding a compromise is difficult, but minor adjustments in a quincunx restore balance, right? Yeah, you keep trying to shove that round peg into a square hole, but honestly, um, if you just kind of reframe the whole thing just a little bit internally, you'll real you'll you'll find that balance. But I do anticipate that there's something that's going to come up that is going to um, bring out. Um, this sense of needing to protect yourself and be cautious in terms of relationship and the responsibility to exercise that caution. Whereas the sun in Libra, two degrees in, in your, it is just like, yeah, but what about the seed of what could be right? Something is going to shift here. Now, the 25th is where Mercury is in a trine to Jupiter retrograde. So again, this is one of those plans, um, planning and optimism and good news. So this is a time where you can actually um, make plans for the future and clean and organize yourself up and, and clean and organize yourself in terms of that advanced training, that long, you're going to plan long-term travel. Maybe you're going to plan um, a new direction in terms of higher education or, or, tra or, or um, advanced training, or just in terms of understanding the big picture with Jupiter in your ninth house. Okay. And the moon's going to come into Aquarius, and which is your sixth house, and you're just going to become very sensitive to how you need to get your shit together. <laughs> and then through Pisces, and then we come to our full moon on the 29th in Aries, right? And this opposition, as all sun moon oppositions, will illuminate what is uh, necessary to to basically apply as the, uh, the light of the, the moon starts to wane in the second half of the cycle. So there's an emotional desire for concrete and stabilized existence as a person in the eighth house, right? So Virgo, you need to be able to work up to this and be able to embrace this, um, how this emotional desire for a stabilized existence is illuminated by your ideals taking concrete form here. It's going to show a lot of where you're at in terms of this. And then Venus is actually going to square Uranus, which has already happened twice already. And it's really going to challenge that stability. Um, and, and, 
increase that need for freedom and excitement and test your patience, um, especially test your patience at the spiritual and transcendental level. And I think that you'll, um, I think what will happen for Virgo people, especially with Virgo rising is that, um, there's going to be this really strong desire to prove oneself, um, in, in that spiritual sense. And the square to Uranus is like, yeah, but where's your patience, right? Where is, if you, feel smothered and confined you're going to lash out and of course venus in the 12th house you very well could be smothered and confined or isolated in terms of relationship and you really want to show your skill set in this way um but if you try to resist the urge for change and excitement that's going to come no matter what and bottle this energy, somebody else in your life is going to express it and it's going to be sudden. Um, and we're again talking about belief systems and big picture um, with the end of the cycle. So just be patient and uh, be willing to kind of entertain and amuse yourself in this situation. It might not be exactly what you want, but it will most likely, um, give you an opportunity to fulfill that need to like, you know, to, for freedom and excitement when otherwise it might be really, uh, you know, it might, you might try to squash it as a Virgo person. And then you're like, Oh shit. Um, it's coming out in some other spontaneous way. So that's going to do it for this Virgo new moon forecast. My friends, thank you for being here. I appreciate all of you so very much. Normally I would be offering you some readings, but I'm taking a break right now as my um, body work practice is, um, you know, going full speed ahead right now. So I don't really at the moment have time to do any more uh, personal readings. But if you are interested in weekly astrology, if you are interested in a private telegram group for the Starseed Fellowship, and if you're interested in, um, you know, monthly monthly group calls where we get to talk to each other about all of this stuff, you may want to consider subscribing through Subscribestar. The link is in the description box. Um, the next Catalyst Classroom uh, quarterly presentation is going to be about um, the Wide Body Area Network, and it's part of a larger series that I've titled Defense Against the Dark Arts. So we've already talked about biochemistry We've already in the body. We've already talked about uh, cymatics and sound, and the uh, Wide Body Area Network is all about the Actual technology um, involved with AI precision healthcare and how you can actually protect yourself and at least become aware of the actual technology that targets the human biofield or the aura or your energy field and um, really bridging the gap from the conceptual woo-woo nature of an aura and actually connecting it to real life technological things so that we can start to take our, our power back in terms of protecting ourselves at this level. Because what I hear is a lot of uh, disclosure of the tech and of the intention behind the tech and the potential, but I don't hear any solutions, none whatsoever, um, except for maybe like very uh, specific location. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next Catalyst Classroom. So again, if you want access to that, you can go to the description box and find the link to Subscribestar and you can support my work and support your process as well and be part of a community. So thank you very much, Virgo. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. Please take care of yourself. Enjoy the new moon as much as you can and I will see you on the next video. Take care.